the Forty OT podcast. We're talking about autism and ADHD as very, as very much a separate thing. So I really want to understand a bit more about the ADHD experience because I know that there are some differences between. So it'd be good to kind of touch on, I guess, the experiences that you had, some of perhaps the 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 difficulties that you may have compared to autistic ADHD is? There are some overlapping traits, right? Which a lot of people probably know if they've looked at them, right? Executive function difficulties, um, you know, a variety of things, but they show up in different ways. Mm -hmm. And one thing I I was thinking about this, that I, I experience almost my ADHD self and my autistic self almost as two characters that are like fighting mm. against each other sometimes in certain ways. The plain tug, and, of, tug of war, push pull kind yeah, of. Yeah. yeah. Cause you know, one part of the, one part of me is like, Oh, I like, I love routine and need routine. And then one part of me is like, it will do it live. Yeah. <laughs> Very much so. And I wonder if I would have that experience if I had not learned about these two things as disorders that are separate, sure. right? Like, so I, I have this conception of them in my mind as these sort of, as opposed to just sort of like, this is the way I am. Yeah. But I, I have noticed cause I, um, so, and I, and I should also just say, you know, regarding say clients that I've worked with, if I'm referring to them, so I've worked with well over a hundred neurodivergent people at this point that wow. the people who are coming to me are mostly white, mostly mm-hmm middle to upper class, right? Like it, it depends. And there's been some, some variation, but like I'm seeing a particular slice of population, right. And they're English speaking and, you know, mostly American. Mm -hmm. So that's like, you know, getting this very particular slice of the neurodivergent experience. So, you know, that's, and then my own experience and my siblings. And one of the really interesting things I've noticed with ADHD specifically is, so there's the autistic ability to make really, really good decisions. There may Mm. be decision fatigue. There may be trouble taking Mm. action on the decision, but this very like, you know, structured thinking through all the options, thinking through all the options as far into the future as you can, right? Like being very good Mm. at at projecting outward into what might happen accurately. Yeah. Um, Autistic people are, I saw one really cool study that indicated that autistic people were less affected by elements of like tricky advertising because we're just trying to make a good decision and we just like yes. ignore the bad. <laughs> I, re- <laughs> like, I relate the, to yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. I'm actually the opposite. It's like if I see an advert <laughs> on the TV, I'm like, I know that you're trying to psychologically manipulate me into buying your product. I'm not going to do it. Yeah, not exactly. It. Like it makes me mad. And <laughs> then, so I've got that, that part of my brain, but then the ADHD part of my brain is like, I don't want to read it. I, I like won't read an instruction manual. I'm like, I don't want to read instructions. Hmm. you know, I like, I just want to try it and just like get my hands dirty and get in there and and do it. And like, you know, even if, even if it's uncomfortable and messy, I would rather just like get started. Yeah. And that ability to just kind of like jump in and take action on all of the information that my brain has been processing. Usually in the night when I'm trying to sleep, my brain's like, let's process all of our ideas. (laughs) So thank you so much. So helpful. But like I've, I have, processed so much information and then there is this part of me this adhd part that's just like yes i can like i can just i'll just start i'll just start doing it i'll just do it shittily yeah. and i have noticed like i'm just and again you know in a, in a particular slice of population that my autistic clients often have trouble actually taking action on the decision without mm. some support so sure. because they're so used to being told that the way they're doing it is wrong and I just don't care. Right. Like, so <laughs> I think like to some extent the ADHD melded together with the autism it is just this really extreme level of not giving a shit about what anybody thinks and being willing to just like do whatever I want. Yeah. You know, yeah. to an extent that's occasionally been harmful, but, <laughs> and like, you know, it doesn't always work out well, but I, there is this like energy behind it that I'm able to just like take action. Um, mm. But then my autistic, you know, scrupulosity and ability to plan and love of routine keeps me from missing too many appointments or, you know, just totally forgetting that something is happening on a day, which I still do on occasion. But like, there's this certain, um, unfortunately, a lot of how that's presented is just anxiety in my system. It's just like, remember the thing, um, which is not fun. But you know, there's, so there's these parts of me that are helping me 
function in this world that was not built for my brain. Mm -hmm. And so again, like those things, you know, kind of come together in this way that have helped me in certain ways, but then it also made it really hard to get support and help because people were like, well, you're achieving and you're doing things. Mm. And I was like, yeah, but I'm like not eating. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) I relate to that. I I suppose I'm really interesting because interested because, you know, in your experience, do you find that leading more into your ADHD side or your autistic side is is the most beneficial for your like overall well being and productivity? Like, oh, do you that have to? It's such a good question. Lean into your autistic traits, or do you lean into your ADHD traits? I am typically happier when I lean into my autistic traits, but mm. my ADHD traits are much more socially acceptable. So sure. I receive more positive feedback when I lean into the ADHD traits. Hmm. And just one small example I'll give of that is when I'm collaborating with someone on an artistic project, I found being willing to just send a shit draft. Yeah. Nobody is ever like, oh my God, you're a bad composer, right? They're just like, oh cool, like let's fix these things. Right. Yes. Yeah. Versus the part of me, and I, I was thinking about this because, you know, I, I was telling you about this, um, I I'm, I have already made it, this um quiz for what's your ADHD superpower? Because I I Mm. looked at like, I was like, what are the overlaps between ADHD and autism, like positives that people, the things people talk about as positive, what are the things that overlap? And then I made a cute little quiz about it. And I was just laughing at myself that I was like, I'm so nervous to give this to you to share with people. This is a free thing. It's for fun. It doesn't matter. Versus when I'm writing literally an orchestral piece, I'm like, F, I just give it to the orchestra and they'll play it and I'll see how I like it. Right. Like yeah. <laughs> my brain is so uneven in how it applies perfectionism to things. And I think that that's yeah. hilarious. That's really interesting. Cause I guess like, I think, I think with, with autism, you know, the, in a lot, a lot of cases, the ideal scenario requires a lot of structure and a lot of planning and routine. And quite often that's not as easy. I think, but I've, I've also heard from, from ADHD is that they also find a lot of use with getting a routine in and, and actually like following it and finding some structure. It's just that they're not like naturally their brain is not inclined to, to do that. Um, whereas with autistic people, we know because we feel anxious, we feel uncomfortable, we feel like in deep water, if we don't have that kind of sense of certainty and structure and routine within our lives. That is the single most frustrating thing as an ADHD person for me, um, is part of me like physically wanting a routine so badly and loving it when I have it. And then no matter what routine I have, it's not going to last for longer than six weeks. You know, break out of your shell yeah. and the my my the... brain is eventually just going to be like, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just throw it out the window. Like it's it does not last. And I, I mean, I literally have studied this. Uh, you know, it became a an area, mm. like habits became an area of special interest for me. So I, I studied it a lot. I know a lot about them. I know a lot about the the physicality of habit formation in the brain. I know a lot about you know um, plasticity in the brain and all of these things. And even with all of this information, I cannot force my neurotype to do something <laughs> that it physically does not want to do. And when I do, when I use willpower to try to force my brain to do something that it doesn't want to do, then I'm just wasting my willpower that I could yeah. be using on eating and showering. <laughs> yeah. The, you know? Using up all of your spoons before, using all of your spoons to go above and beyond everything, work and productivity related, but then leaving no spoons for you to, to sort of self-care and executive functioning and stuff. Yeah. Which makes sense because nobody's praising me for showering, except maybe no. my partner, I guess, if I get really gross. <laughs> well, I suppose as well, like, you know, the only, <laughs> you know, I, a lot of the stuff that I do is online. So people weren't really be able to say, I'll just dry shampoo mm-hmm. it, put some mm-hmm. deodorant on for my own well-being. Um, <laughs> yeah. You know, it, yeah, definitely. And it, it, it just, it seems for me that it just takes so much more energy to do that than to produce like the high level of content or produce the, produce something that that's very detailed. Yeah. I was going to say you produce a lot. 
of content. Yeah, but that's what I mean. So it's like, <laughs> on one hand, I can I can do this thing, and yeah, it's probably going to be good, or I can just leave it up until a point where it's really difficult and just have a burnout and get it all sorted. And <laughs> yeah, obviously that's not the best down. way to do it, but. I think I'm, I, I try to leave as many spoons for myself as possible. Um, it's just, you know, as you said, that that interest dynamic of wanting to um, do things that you find interesting is just so, so strong for me. Yeah. And that is one of the other things with the, you know, ADHD together is the level of hyper focus I can engage in is mm. absolutely wild. Forget to like, eat, forget to go to the toilet, <laughs> I, one, forget one to one drink. Yeah, one time I forgot to eat for three days, and <laughs> you do that one time, and people just never let you live it down ever. <laughs> yeah, I only once, but yeah, I frequently will forget to eat for like a whole day, um, or or I'll be thinking about it, and I'll be like, I can't remember the last time mm. I ate. Because I, ma- I imagine that's quite that's quite hard because you know there there is an element with with autism around things like transitions, like transitioning from one thing to another and I think a lot of people incorrectly think of it as only being an issue when you when you're transitioning into something that you like like I love going to the gym often very often pretty much every day I have a difficulty transitioning into leaving to go to the gym like every day not not, you know I, I love going it makes me feel great and it's my interest I love watching the videos and listening to the videos while I'm working out and you know, just just in completely just enthralling myself in that in that special interest, but still, it's it's so difficult. And it, even going so far as you know, I start work, and then as you said, you just you just continue working on it and working on it, and it's like you've got this like steam train brain, where it's like it's really hard to get started, but once you get started, and the more that you do, and the faster that you go it just stays at that speed and it's just so hard to just like put the brakes on and you have, it takes you ages to go to like halt to a stop. And if you try to do it too quickly, you get overwhelmed, you get emotionally (laughs) dysregulated. You're like, Oh my God, you fall off the tracks. You're like, Oh my God, everything's gone off. Your car goes gone. And then the day's gone. And you know, it's the time at which you would have gone to do a certain activity is past and it's better just to kind of, reset yeah and what you're describing like one of the things i have that exact experience one of the things that can happen in that experience is that one of my routines disappears during that Mm. like you know it doesn't even have to be a meltdown it can just be a a, like a big either a really hard day or like a transition that's like really doesn't go well or like thinking i'm going to do something and then i don't and then having one of those like really hard periods of time around it like as you're describing and then it's like the next day when I wake up, one of my routines is gone from my brain. And I'm like, no. <laughs> and, you know, like I, part of, part of what I want to, you know, express in my public life and being, you know, sort of vulnerable about the difficulties I still have, even after doing a lot of work is that this is not a problem. Hmm. A lot of what I'm experiencing as like, oh, I hate this, that this routine is disappearing, sure. you know, or, or that I had a really bad day and that like that did something to my brain that mm-hmm. I don't understand. And now my, one of my routines is like gone, just gone, gone. Yeah. And I can't, can't get it back. Right. I know how to rebuild it from scratch, but that's no fun. And I don't yeah. get the same dopamine rebuilding the same routine from scratch. So it actually doesn't work most of the time. And sure. ADHD people will know exactly what I'm talking about. Like this is such a common experience. You know, you don't have that excitement of starting yeah, something new it's just, when and you're so like just, motivated. I can't, and... I can't get into it. But on the other hand, like the other thing my brain is capable of doing is one time I was just casually making art with friends in a dorm room yeah. and I looked up and everybody was staring at me and I was like, what? And they were like, you just looked down and you didn't move or talk or do anything except make art for three straight hours. And you just like literally your body didn't do anything else. You just made the art and, <laughs> and then you suddenly and then you looked up and we were all like, oh, my God, are they OK? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, so my brain has this capacity to go really deep and just like totally get lost. Mm. I had a similar experience yeah. at university as well, because 
around about that time, I think it's about my first year at university, I went into this like dorm room kind of complex of different different students with their own places. And I think there was like this summer day where everyone was kind of relaxing and chilling out, you know, drinking and, and doing all that kind of studenty stuff. And I was like, oh, actually, I need to get some need to get some training in today. So I had this kind of like sandbag stand that I filled with water. And it had like this pole that went up and it had some like kick pads at different heights on it and stuff. And I just went up there and I, st- I just kicked the pads for like two hours. And people started to notice because there was like a window going onto the, onto the thing. And they, they started coming up and they were like, oh, you've been, you've been here a while. Like, are you going to, when are you going to finish? And I'm like, oh, I don't know. I kind of don't want to stop. <laughs> And and it's the same like after taekwondo training sessions when when I came home after like a couple of hours of training, really really struggled to to stop, and like so I'd have a routine where I come home after training after I've been depleted after two hours, where I had like a kettlebell and I just do like kettlebell jumps until my legs couldn't move and then I then I go to sleep. The only time that I really feel like there's no time pressure is when I'm traveling. I love traveling mm. because if I'm on the train for like five hours or two hours, I know that there's nothing else that I can do. So anything that I do do during that time, it's a positive. So yeah, I love it's just correct. Like, <laughs> exactly. So it's like I can't I can't go and exercise. I can't do a podcast. I literally it's like it narrows the amount of things that I'm able to do and it makes me feel safer that I have that that narrowing so I always just love any any time I'm having a car journey or a train journey or anything like that I love to just get stuck in like with one of the few things that I can do and feel completely comfortable and I guess fine with it and and not Mm -hmm. like give myself a hard time and it's paralysis decision paralysis or you know something like that i I struggle with that quite a lot 